Okay, great. Um, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm really excited. This is our first event uh, of the lecture series here in Florence, here in Florence, here and everywhere in Florence uh, for the spring 22. Um, I want to thank everybody who's able to join us online today, our students, but also I see some uh, friends. Ciao, Emily. Nice to see people from main campus as well. Uh, if we said this many times in the past year and a half, but if the pandemic has given something to us, it's definitely the ability to do and share these events uh, with a much broader audience. So I'm really excited about that. And um, I want to thank again, uh, Dean Speaks and Associate Dean Julia Cerniak for their help in coordinating and supporting these events, uh, which would not be possible otherwise. Um, but today I am really excited to launch our series with Yara Fegali from Los Angeles. You're in LA now, correct? Yes, awesome. Um, <clears throat> so uh, one of the core elements of our experience here in Florence um, is perhaps the survey of Italian architecture course. Um, we see the course as an incredible opportunity to learn about specific architectural examples uh, from antiquity to contemporary practices. Um, and we also recognize as a rich opportunity uh, to think about what it means to be today as architects in the field. Um, or how do we look at the built environment? Uh, how do we position ourselves as abroad students uh, engaging with a foreign culture. Um, what do we learn from it and what modes of representation can we deploy uh, to reflect on the many pressures that we encounter as a society? And so in the past few semesters, we have introduced uh, slowly and uh, steadily uh, maybe some conversation around digital surveying technologies uh, to address some of these questions. Um, and so as a research group, we see this as an open-ended investigation, uh, perhaps to reflect on the role of imaging uh, in creating cross-cultural spaces of exchange. Uh, for example, this semester, we're focusing on the possibilities of multimedia composition, uh, working between LIDAR scanning and photogrammetry, to construct time-based representation of public sites here in Florence. Um, and as you all know very well, I'm sure if one of the biases that are embedded in these techniques uh, is to freeze uh, scanned sites in time, to render them as if they're static and never changing. Um, we're aiming as a group to highlight the ever-changing multifaceted identities of these environments uh, through what we could call a time-based analysis. And so um, from this perspective, really, I could have not hoped for a better guest to launch this conversation. Um, Yara's research on contemporary imaging practices an interactive gaming environment uh, to address press and social and urban themes, uh, I think will be an incredible source of inspiration for our work. Um, besides being a dear friend, uh, I am truly excited to have her join us uh, as a reference to think through imaging as a cultural practice. Um, and so to make the most of sort of this uh, time where we are joining us from all over the world. Many of us are uh, on very far east uh, timeline. So I'm gonna try and keep this as short as I can. So, uh, but I'll copy in the chat a link to the event page uh, where you can learn a little bit more about Yara. Uh, but in short, Yara is a French and Lebanese architectural designer working at the intersection of architecture, education, transmedia, and immersive technologies. She's the creative director of Folly Feast Lab, uh, co-founded with Viviane Elkmati. Her studio is based in the lovely and sunny and amazing Santa Monica, 
uh, and creates visually led immersive and interactive experiences using AI, game engines, and 3D scanning technology. Yara is a faculty at UCLA, uh, A, U, and D, uh, teaching design studio and technology seminars at the graduate level. Uh, she has also taught at SciArc in LA, at SAC, at Frankfurt, um, at the Bartlett in London, at the ALDA in Beirut. So again, thank you everyone for joining. Thank you, Yara, for uh, coming. And I'm very thankful for your willingness to share your work and your research with our digital community. So uh, welcome. Yeah, thank you so much. I hope I can live up to <laughs> your introduction. <laughs> Um, I'm excited also to be here and always extremely happy and excited to be in conversation with um, you, Daniele and Maya. So hopefully this is um, part of our continuing discussion. I'm going to share a screen. Please do let me know if you see the wrong screen. Um, yeah. You should be seeing the screen and not the notes. Yeah, it's great. Oh, perfect. OK. Um, so, all interactive. So thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for having me today and excited to share the work. As you mentioned, I co-founded Polyfeast Lab with Vivian Elkmati in 2019. Most of the work you will see today is from the past three years. Uh, we run Polyfeast Lab together and we create uh, visually led immersive and interactive experiences to address present social themes and urban themes we're based in Santa Monica, very sunny, in Los Angeles, and um, we have an acute focus on creatively working with artificial intelligence, photogrammetry, virtual reality, and networking technology. Um, today's talk is titled All Interactive, Developing Experiences as Design Research. So let's dive into the world of interaction. Interactivity responds to the question, how much am I doing? Meaning, where are you on the spectrum of being a passive recipient to an active player? An interaction could be you liking a video on TikTok. It could be playing Monument Valley or Sims. A passive reception, recipient would be someone who's swiping through images, exploring a VR world, even uh, being able to see infographics, but not really being able to do much other than looking. Closer to the active player, it's quite the opposite, right? So you're able to see stuff, but you're able also to customize, to play, to design new elements, and you would be considered a very active user. The second word that I want to define before we start everything is immersion, which would answer the question of how deep do I want to go? And that spectrum ranges from the physical to the virtual. So immersion could be you reading a novel or binging a series and being completely transported to these worlds. Uh, but in our case, we're talking about spatial immersion. So on one part of the spectrum, you're immersed through your smartphone, screen, tablet, laptop, and you're playing, for example, Pokemon Go in augmented reality. Or you're somewhere where you're working in a digital space at the same time as in your physical environment, which would be the finest mixed reality. And on the highest part of the spectrum, you're immersed in virtual reality, visiting, for example, the Golden Gate Bridge through Google VR Street View. And that leads us to this diagram that was developed by Vivian that we use a lot in Folly Feast Lab, where you see the immersive, not immersive axis and interactive, not interactive. And these define four quadrants, and we're going to be looking at the lower two quadrant and the upper right. So if you are in a not interactive, not immersive space, and then you are in the coral one, you're looking at visuals, but you're not doing anything. If you are in an immersive space, uh, sorry, an interactive space, but that is not immersive, you're looking at visuals and you're doing some things. And for us, the most interesting one is when you are in an immersive space and interactive, so you're inside an immersive virtual space, and you're also doing a lot of things. So think Graphic this. computer. The device maps the room in order to construct a digital map of the space, allowing Penny to fill the room with holograms. What you see here is next generation hand tracking. Penny moves the holograms throughout the room in real time and space. The boxes react using physics-based simulations, just like they would in the real physical world. Sorry, Penny. This may be a bad time, but the clan is on an earlier... 
So I assume a lot of you have seen this, so I'm going to continue. Hopefully you were hearing everything. Um, so we're here, this talk is divided in three. The work I'm going to show is divided in three parts. The first one is going to be low immersive, low interactive, which uh, are basically artificial intelligence simulation. The second part is going to be low immersive and interactive, um, which are going to be 2D games. And the last part is going to be immersive and just give me a second. <laughs> My window is going to be immersive and interactive, um, which is going to be the metaverse. Sounds obscure, but let's unpack that with a short intro into our theoretical references before we go into the work. Um, so one of the first one I would say, I always call it as Donna Haraway um, with her cyborg manifesto. She defines us as cyborg, arguing that we are one with technology. She writes about gender, technology, and fiction. And reading it again today is poignant to realize how much she got right about our contemporary culture. At Folifis Lab and in my teaching at UCLA, we focus on the role of technology in designing spaces. And we make interactive um, application two, which I cannot think of a better reference, uh, reference than Hitosh Terrell, because when we say interaction and immersion, we inherently talk about the medium of game. So we design interaction with game engine. Um, Hitosh Terrell gave a super interesting talk in 2016 in Barcelona called Why Games Can Art Professional Think? as a tribute to Harun Faroqi. Um, this talk is is um, her going through the history of games, starting from the Turing test to Google CAPTCHA, Are You a Robot, getting inspired from Faroqi last work on video game and VR. She argues that interactivity and immersion are the currencies of the future, monetizing your attention through your endless clicks, swipes, and scroll. Um, another reference is um, maybe still on the political side, but less in terms of theory, more in terms of popular culture, is Shira Chess. And she talks about the importance of narrative and gameplay, which we are going to call interactivity in making games. Um, there's a bunch of other uh, new media and digital culture critic um, that we're gonna bring up maybe later or super relevant to this type of work, but Lev Manovich is an important one to mention. And in his 2020 book on cultural analytics, he, one of his 12 research challenges is to define the fundamental new ways of understanding and studying visual and media cultures enabled by computational methods of um, using large data sets. So this brings us to today. So why interactive and why now? So I'm, this is a bit technical, but hang on. This is the um, diagram of the spatial web or where we are spatially, digitally in terms of um, web structure. So to the left, you see there's interface, which is interaction, the logic, which is the computation, data, which is the information. And with the start of internet, you can see that the interface is the desktop, the logic and the computation is a program, and the data is the LAN connection. With web 1.0, the interface becomes the browser. So you click and you type. Instead of a program, you have websites, and the data is stored in structure servers. In 2010, we have web 2.0, which suddenly on our mobile, you touch and swipe, the computing is done by apps and data is stored in the cloud. So lastly, which is the most interesting one for us right now is in 2020, we enter 3.0, web 3.0, which is also called metaverse, but we like to call it spatial web. It's also called spatial web technically. So as Folifis Lab, we really operate into that last um, chunk um, where the interface is wearable like AR, VR, and you show and tell, and this is where narrative becomes an important key, um, visuals, aesthetic, imagery, and the logic is artificial intelligence. The data is stored through distributed ledger technology, blockchain. So basically what it's saying is that you're wearing a VR, AR device, you're computing through AI, and you're sorting through blockchain, which means you have data privacy, and you have smart, responsive environment, and you have immersive experiences. This is like a loose translation, <laughs> just to make a bit more sense in terms of architecture. Um, I would say the interface logic and data of modernism would be doing built like think Le Corbusier, building plan, laws and regulation. Uh, in the 80s with this deconstructivism, we see the rise of importance in sketches, drawings and models, importance of the logic of sectional and volume uh, volumetrics. Um, think OMA, Gary, and data is social and cultural. 
So with parametricism, we, if you want things that Hadid, uh, the interface becomes smarter with Grasshopper and BIM. The logic is performance and productivity and the data is uh, materiality and statistic. And I would say 2020 and forward, the interface is materiality and storytelling. The logic is through AI behavioral trees and simulation and the data is uh, stored on the blockchain. So which leads me to the question, how can games produce design research? Which is what I'm gonna attempt to answer today. And more precisely, how can developing interactive and immersive game with players feedback loop produce a design research? So let's dive into the work. Um, the first part, as I said, low interactive, low immersive with artificial intelligence simulation. Remember, we are in the coral part of that diagram. The first work I want to show is Wild Choreography. It's a two weeks workshop I taught at UCLA this past summer um, at Ideas. It's based on agent simulation and surface modeling. The project site is the notorious Beverly Hills six way intersection. Um, and it's our wild choreography stage. We studied the speed and aerodynamism of various form of urban transportation from electric scooter, bikes, car, and buses to delivery robots, as you can see in those five plates. We were able to access our design through performance and go to assess our design through performance and go back and forth between designing and testing. This workshop provocation is to shift an understanding of architecture from an organizational logic to one of movement. So we want to design through metrics and have constant feedback loops of data. So we study traffic movement and learn how to read the pattern of vector flow in them. So students produced these, which are a version of their transportation vehicle and tested their velocity, as you can see in the fluid, uh, fluid dynamics graph. We, Sorry, you're gonna hear my dog. Um, I apologize for that. So we went, then we wrote scripts to the side of their movement around and through this intersection in Beverly Hills, resulting in an AI driven simulation. So the, the designing at this stage is basically designing the script. So it results in these uh, various narrative and world building around these vehicle design. They're able to dodge, navigate through the transportation crowd, um, the goal is to have a smooth circulation and this way of thinking is trans transferable. So instead of transportation, we could, um, we could think about people moving through an open space, through a building with vertical circulation and so on. Um, those were simulation played on the screen. The movement is designed through coding and once you click and play, it runs on its own in real time. So it scores low interactive and low and immersive. Maybe another project using similar logic, but much more complex since it happened on a longer period. So the other one was two weeks, this is three months. Um, adapting to the next normal is a real-time quantifiable feedback loop. This um, seminar was developed. Sorry, this seminar was developed um, as a technical support class for Greg Lynn's studio when we taught together last year at UCLA Ideas. It centers on how we can occupy um, shared public space safely in our COVID-19 era. So we studied through um, simulation and quantifiable feedback, five different building type, and how we can have clean airflow and visitor flow um, through the building. Oh, now it's playing. I was wondering why it wasn't playing. Um, 
We worked on a mixed use building and contrary to the vehicle, this building has multiple function. So we designed again through coding and uh, we used uh, a new workflow in beta version in Unity called uh, GOAP, resulting in these sorts of diagrams. So if you want to, let me help you read them a bit. So it's um, for the one to the left, if you want take a gym coach who gets to work, what are the different actions that they would do? They would go to the machine, attempt to apply and take break, coaching and so on. And this simulation will draw the pathway that these coaches will do uh, take during these various tasks. And if you wanna think about it, if you change the position of these pathway, as you can see on the bottom left, then all of that network um, of circulatory path will change. So same as the previous project, even though intense computer, on computing, once set up, it runs on its own. So this is why it scores low on interaction and immersion. So now let's jump into the interactive part, which is 2D games um, that still scores low on immersive, but higher on the interactive part. So we are in the purple bottom part of that diagram. And we're doing things while also looking at visuals. Um, <laughs> this might be familiar to some of you. My living room is public, happened right at the turn of the pandemic. We started in March, 2020, this class. It's a twisted documentation on the spaces we inhabit. We were isolated in our domesticity and used that constraint as a starting point of the seminar, working our way from realism towards abstraction. So we generated 3D scans of our domestic environment and used them to um, propose a new, propose an app with the students together. So it was inspired by photogrammetry, which is the result, as you know, of taking multiple images from a space and reconfiguring it in 3D as a point cloud. We were inspired by Gerhard uh, Richter overpainted photograph and his juxtaposition of oil paint brush abstraction on hyper real imagery. And we took the traditional process of making architecture from the model kit to 3D model with the cut and making 2D in Rhino to draw plans rendering and building it. And we started to take all of that process, but do it in reserve, in reverse. So instead of finishing with a rendering physical space, we started from the built environment and work our way backwards uh, until the model kit. So these were some of the results of uh, the cinema graph that the students produced. Some of them merge their 3D or four living spaces into one. Again, that was like the first months of the pandemic of remote uh, teaching and they could be digitally together. You can see unwrapped version of um, spaces as plan and uh, elevation drawing and photogrammetry stays true to the lighting resolution and quality of the spaces being scanned. Um, another group worked on entourage, emptying architecture from all the mobile and the stuff that are not uh, walls or architecture as such. We then used these parts and developed a game where we could design through that kit of part, a new fictive uh, living room with your colleagues, with different students could merge together and develop these. As you see on the bottom of these four screens, uh, there's four buttons that will let you generate new parts, rotate, arrange, and even change the point of view of the camera. Uh, I was lucky to run 
to be invited to run this workshop again at um, the International Pride Forum Digital Futures. And you can see how it looks different. Um, we changed the background, but also the type of work that students were able to scan were centered more on domestic but collaborative space. That's a summer later. So um, when uh, regulation and restriction were a bit looser and you can see that students decided to scan themselves, plants, um, different part of their apartment and also worked on the scalar shift using the same application. Um, this is more recent. Um, that's from the end of 2021, that's a month ago. This is a design studio at UCLA where we looked at different residential types in LA. So we looked at the fabric of Venice Canal houses, R2 housing, townhouses, towers, loft, urban uh, apartment core, and the Los Angeles thing that, and the outcome of this work was this uh, game in my section where we did an operation manual app to serve as a collective intellectual uh, repository, quantifying a taxonomy of LA types to draw from and deploy in a uh, future conjecture. As you can see on the left, you can click any of the button and you can attract and repel and um, you will see them pop on the screen. And then you can also see how many you have, what is your total build, um, square footage, and you can also change cam, export your OBJ or uh, have an image output. And this game was used as a design research uh, tool and was the start of the studio work. These are a few examples of what the outcome of the studio work um, looked like. Again, it's a landscape and building design studio. Um, maybe the last project in that section in part two is a project at Follow Feast Lab, uh, very different in nature. This uh, was an awareness project about Beirut, our hometown. We have both, uh, we are both Lebanese. And in August 4th, 2020, the city was shaken down by an enormous blast and this destroyed its economy and was the motivation behind this awareness project. It destroyed the economy, but also the city physical fabric. It's a virtual exhibition um, uh, created by Studio 106 in LA. It was part of an exhibition also at the A plus D Museum and part of uh, two podcasts for the Wedge Gallery and uh, Digital Saloon. In LA, um, Talk About Beirut is an awareness project displayed as an online exhibition. It's a story that is told about Beirut through the lenses of several artists from Lebanon, US, Germany, Kazakhstan, and Switzerland. Um, Beirut is a beautiful city which has been undergoing a series of traumatic events and currently faces a devastating outcome of recent happenings. So with this project, we wanted to raise the awareness and also lead to um, a page where you could make a donation. So it featured a before and after, and uh, that was our input. So we were in the after and after the explosion uh, part, and this is what they would look like um, two months after the explosion. And 3D scanning was an interesting medium to do that because 3D scanning in nature removes some part of the building. So it was kind of easier to digest what was happening. 
at least visually, because the building looked destroyed anyways, <laughs> uh, photogrammetry. Um, and now we jumped into the third part, which is immersive interactive, which is the spatial web. Um, and I want to remind you, we are on that gradient upper right side, and um, we pass from like physical, uh, spatial uh, immersion to virtual immersion. Uh, virtual Herbaria is a two week workshop that I give uh, past summer at UCLA. It questions the way we visualize and utilize large data sets, archives, and libraries. This comes back to Lev Manovich, an earlier reference with today's uh, an earlier reference. So with today's technology, we have access to an infinite amount of online data and years of archive and knowledge at our fingerprint. Algorithms that can sort, search through, and identify hierarchy in that database are becoming extremely valuable because they are able to tell apart correct information from construct. In the last few years, we have seen the backlash of manipulated content and the potency of fictitious representation a lot in the US. Um, we're calling representation, reality, and artifice into questions with this catastrophic repercussion of the crypto market on our environment. We will address climate change in the Anthropocene and put our preconceived understanding of nature and technology under scrutiny. Our site is the online herbarium of the Southern Californian desert, the Mojave Desert near Joshua Tree National Park. And virtual herbaria aims at reviving the Californian desert herbarium archive into an immersive visual uh, experience through spatializing that data. So we started with a 10 herbarium sample where students um, would take and redesign. As you can see, the bottom, the upper part are the real samples, the bottom part are the fictive, fictitious redesigned one. And um, we use Unity Game Engine to design virtual environment where you would go around and plant different uh, redesign if you want the landscape. So we augmented them, as you can see on the right side, the exhibition wall, and um, in the lower part, there's a zoom on that's one student plate and the AR augmented version of it. And then we designed a virtual herbaria application game where you could access the app and you could uh, screen and walk explore and plant new specimen to design your individual landscape. These are some of the results. As a previous uh, work, students created a whole world around their designed cacti. So some uh, kind of world building. Uh, some people cook it further than other. I was happy to run this workshop again this past summer as a 10 day workshop for BPRO at the Bartlett. And maybe because it's not in London, it's different than the Californian desert, the results were um, more extreme on the world building side. So we had underwater, mushroom world, and uh, more fictitious uh, scenes.
So you can see them in real time planting plant, uh, trees and cacti and walking around. And it's also accessible in VR. Um, Spatial Fabulation is an exhibition we did in Frankfurt when I was teaching at the SAC, the Städel Schule Architecture class. And it's a VR exhibition that led to a publication that I co-edited on VR and came out last year. Um, and I was teaching thesis, and these were uh, an example of the student work working in VR. So that student specifically had designed, um, she designed these um, carving tool that were designed depending on the three architects you can see to the left. And other people work range from um, game interfaces to um, using photogrammetry and represent and tell stories of a city. Um, it led to a publication we worked on for more than a year and it was pushed on because of COVID. It finally got published and put in, in late 2021. Um, the book is divided in half. The first half are written contribution by VR artists and theoretician, and the second half is a portfolio of VR work ranging from uh, various types of VR application. Um, you can find it online. After the Jesus Studio in Frankfurt, I, did an, I ran another Jesus Studio at um, UCLA in Los Angeles, and we focused on the city of Los Angeles and understanding its urban identity. So today there is an urgency to address our city's cultural messiness, messy in the best way. This research studio explored Los Angeles' lush diversity by uncovering its multiple layers of resolution. We speculate through interactive storytelling on the near future of cultural spaces. Architecture thrives through multiple mediums. In this specific research studio, we will be interested in architecture as a visual apparatus, which you know all about. Um, we're concerned with the representation. China Down at Home was one of the students' work. It's a speculation on technology behind photogrammetry. It explores uh, friction between texture and volume. Chinatown is a recognizable architectural style that has been copied in every major city in the US. She explores the idea of following through the use of mapping technologies and convolutional neural network mapping our exterior and interior domesticity. Um, it resulted, you can see her, she did a, a YouTube page where she reviews her games. Uh, it resulted in a designing a design platform, a game that will convert any space into your own Chinatown. Uh, they're also an AR app. And we work with machine aesthetic, photogrammetry, and cinematography um, technique. Other projects look at the culture of diversity on the UCLA campus or on the Sunset Boulevard with a work that looks at fashion and using, that was the early start of Zoom interfaces to communicate um, the work. Other imagining what would the city look like if it were to be designed by an AI. These speculations result in interactive platforms and game used as design research on aesthetics and urban design scale. Um, Leaky LA is maybe the oldest project in here. I'll go a bit over because I'm afraid of running uh, out of time. It was done in 2018. It's a speculative streetscape design exploring the future of AI generated aesthetics on the facades of downtown Los Angeles. Um, this AI transfers ex extravagant Rococo fabric onto these facades and results in strangely beautiful environment and visualized through personalized VR apps. This corner is designed with machine vision and human vision and an immersive, resulting in an immersive space. Different type of representation overlap and the aesthetic bleeds into the sidewalk, resulting in an instance of leaking between digital and physical worlds. Um, and now we get to more recent work. Uh, finally, we get to projects uh, before last. In 2019, we were asked to join LA Forum to be part of the five architects vision of LA in 2020. So that was 2019 before we knew the pandemic was about to happen. And um, we initially proposed a VR exhibition um, with mixed reality and VR headset, but of course that wasn't possible. So we turned it into a drive in exhibition, we worked with a writer who told us about her experience of coming to LA. 
uh, back when being queer was unacceptable everywhere outside of LA and San Francisco. The exhibition opened up during COVID and um, there was an effort to rethink exhibition spaces with social distance and ventilation. And it got retitled Everything Changes 2020. So for our work in reaction to that discussion we had with our writer, we looked at 20 different residential neighborhoods in LA and teased out the particularities of their domestic front porches. Um, the story is told through the point of view that is aligned perfectly with the space. Um, if you were to drive a car in, you could see from your passengers, uh, from the driver's side and front window, as you can see here on the lower right. So you would drive into a garage, it's projected on two walls, and they're all reconstructed, um, like about 28, I think, um, 3D scans of different residential houses in LA that are recomposed into a seamless uh, streetscape. Um, stereotypical symbols of queer culture and their manifestation on the house's front porches are the uh, focus on this of this work. Uh, on the bottom left, you can see the map of um, all the different places where these houses are 3D scanned from. So Venice, Culver City, Echo Park, Silver Lake, downtown, even Hollywood, Santa Monica, Koreatown, and other. Um, this is what the space looked like, and uh, all institutions were closed, so we were lucky to have a private residential parking in Silver Lake, and people would drive in and out, like you would drive in and out of a takeout place. The projected immersive experience allows visitors to maintain social distancing guidelines by remaining in their cars and watching from the inside. The drive-in portrays a filming diary of sorts viewed through the visitor's own car window as they were themselves driving through the reconstructed queer neighborhoods. It's all done in point cloud and scanning technologies and it's influenced by the way we developed our immersive wall, uh, which would have been totally different if we did it in a headspace. You can see me sitting in the car on the right and looking at, uh, imagining how it would look like if we looked from the side and front window. The speed was adapted, so when you would drive in, you wouldn't get uh, like dizzy or sick. So it's a bit now it's a bit quicker, but in reality, it was a slower version of this. And this is a teaser; it was the full version. So it's like that smooth background music and streetscape noises. And the reason why the screen is divided in two, like there's a quarter and a full screen, this is where the wall was. So everything straight looking was to the left and everything um, that has perspective was on the right wall. And when they were projected, they really looked like you were in that 3D space. that was high res enough. Uh, if not, I'll link you to our website where you can check it out. 
The last project that I'm going to show is the Mediterranean Sea Diaries. And this project started in 2019. It's still in development and will be for the coming two years. So I'll show the pitch that um, this project started with. Um, this project is uh, in this project, our research is centered around the Mediterranean coastline and the e-waste economy uh, that we call the afterlife of overproduction. It's an interactive AI generated VR forum about sustainable technologies and their build to dumb syndrome. So we were honored to be part of Fiber Festival where we presented the version that I'm gonna show you of it. I'm gonna show you a um, shorter version, but uh, this is what it looked like back then. Mediterranean Sea Diaries is a project that imagines, imagines the future of post-human spaces like landfills and e-waste lands as a result of overproduction. These spaces are generated as a cautionary tale of the Mediterranean coast near future and are based on recent events around the politics of waste management leading to Lebanon in 2000, around 2015, dumping its waste into the Mediterranean Sea. It all started with looking at our phones, VR headset, tablets, PC, laptops, and smartwatches, and wondering what happens to them once they turned uh, off. So they turned out to be designed for the dump. So they are made to be thrown away after a few years and almost uh, never recycled. Um, through the eyes of surveillance drone, we watch Amal and her trained dogs roam around garbage, searching for early versions of flip flops that have become extremely valuable due to their impossibility of being tracked. We work through the same mediums as I already described. The world is generated by AI and inhabited by simulated people and pets that wander through the terrain, looking for rare materials to scavenge. It is a network VR space that holds events every two weeks to discuss, um, to discuss uh, th this specific theme. And you can wander around and find rare material, build shelter, or dive underwater. The narrative of that VR networking world is a queer narrative as defined by Shira Chess that I mentioned in the introduction in um, her writing on the queer case of video games in 2016. It is an interactive experience where the environment will react to your touch and movement. Um, so we are high on the immersive and interactive spectrum. Uh, it's a collective experience, so it's also networked VR, where you are not alone in VR. The topics are set by the UN goals for sustainability and for the a future, a sustainable future. So I want to finish with a quick wrap up. So we started with a question, how can developing interactive and immersive games with player feedback loop produce design research? And this is a thesis, thesis that I, we will continue working on through teaching in our studio at Fall Leaf Lab. Hopefully we showed you a various way of doing that. And uh, we are, we are uh, interested in the spatial web. This is why we work with the RAR devices. We compute using AI. Um, computational logic, and we sort through using the blockchain. We're more focused on the first two, but getting better in that last one. Um, hopefully we can continue to discuss. Thank you so much. And um, if you didn't see everything I showed you in high res, please check out our website or my website where you will find uh, more project, maybe more up-to-date project, but definitely all of the things I showed you in higher resolution. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yara. This was uh, this was fantastic. I hope I didn't speak too much and my accent wasn't <laughs> too harsh. <laughs> no, it was it was great. Uh, I want to, if if you're okay with that, I would like to open the the space for a little bit of a Q and A session. Yeah, I would love to. Okay, that's awesome. Uh, so uh, because I know that, and my students know that as well, I can easily. Uh, take all the space in the room. I would like to <laughs> open it up to the students or to other uh, members of the audience if they have any questions for, for Yara. OK. 
Come on, this is the classic uh, Zoom, uh, <laughs> Zoom uh, anxiety. Any question is a good question. Should we live through the through the pain? Yeah, through the silence. <laughs> Team, come on. I have a question. Um, just uh, I'm curious what softwares you use to like create the AI world or all the videos. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Um, well, we. Um, for, so for doing photogrammetry, we use um, like Metashape and uh, Agisoft Metashape. I always call it Agisoft, but it's Metashape. Um, it depends what's in the world. So that world comes together in Unity um, Game Engine. Um, we use uh, for the different visual and um, modeling, we use Metashape for 3D scanning. Uh, Mesh Lab for sorting through the scans. We use Maya for modeling. For example, the plant, the cactus, the cars, all of that was on Maya. And then all of that gets texturized and it gets dropped in the Unity environment. And this is where all the technical like AI scripting and so on happens. So um, there's a workflow in Unity called simulation and it runs on AI. And it uses, um, there's a few sets already set uh, stuff that you can try with, but we write our own um, codes to run all of that. It's, um, and then we use uh, the platforms we use to view the work, our VR headsets um, and our and web interfaces. Yeah, I think that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, sure. And we learned a lot of that by an enormous amount of patience, <laughs> but a lot of online tutorials. So I would, um, yeah, I would push all of you to do that and not be shy or intimidated by these. Uh, I also have a technical question. So for all the video and picture show, uh, I found you are so good at controlling the color. I mean, you, you use many uh, color with a uh, high saturation. But it looks so beautiful. But what I'm doing that when I work, I I make the color have higher saturation. I feel it's really hard to control. I will always create very messy pictures. So I wonder, uh, how um, uh, so what's the steps? Do you start with just a uh, black, white, grayscale model, and then add the color, add the saturation on that, or just randomly choose the color you want and create very fantastic drawings? <laughs> Thank you. That's so nice. Yeah, it's a question we get a lot. Um, so what I so we work with uh, doing research on the topics that we're working with, and then we inspire our color uh, palette from these. Um, but what I tell my students when they're working is an easy way to do that is find a painting that you really like, that you like the colors, a painting that has like, I don't know, not more than 10 colors that you really think is beautiful. And then I would just use it in Photoshop and pick the pigments and use them because if they're working in that painting, it means that they already work together. So I would use that painting and then pick those pigments and you will see that they will work together because they're already uh, compositionally and color wise working in that painting. I hope yeah, that's helpful. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. But oh. we also use so many things Sorry, just let me add sorry. something. We, we sorry, use sorry. a lot of, we, we use a lot of, um, if you want, you can call them filters and different way of processing aesthetics in Unity, which make it render, you know, super high ray, ray, uh, res and have a glow and have all of these kind of filter look like that you see. They're called shaders. 
and they're a lot of what's making the visual look so realistic in one case or so saturated and full of colors. That, for example, in its Darian Sea Diaries, we were looking at what happens to forests and places after a wildfire. And you have all of those exotic plants that regrow and they have these highly saturated colors. It's like plants are like flashy yellow neon pink. And this is where the inspiration for these colors come from in our work. Sorry, I cut you off, Lani. No, it's it's all good. Thank you. Um, thanks for your um, for sharing. Actually, I have a I have a question uh, because um, the thing that you you told like you you talked it's more like a um, we're designing again. So so actually, my question is: Do you think we are take um, game designers' job, or we kind of like robbed it? Mm -hmm. Sorry, I'm not trying to be offensive, but yes, because it's... <laughs> no, it's a good question. Yeah. No, I think it's a good question, you know, like when I was showing the different uh, stacks of web, you know, and you can understand in architecture, you know, we took animation and representation of cinema graph or we show and present work through, you know, animation. So we take a lot from cinematography, which is also a different field. So I would say I definitely believe that our work is cross-disciplinary, meaning we use from dis different discipline in architecture. Um, and we call them games because they're made on a game engine and they have interaction and immersion in them. So technically it's called a game, but it's not a game. I mean, in Folifi's lab, we produce game which you can play in VR and have levels and are an actual game. But what I presented today are um, world and interactive and immersive experiences that are built through game engines, but I, would, I wouldn't define them as the normal game like Monument Valley or uh, League of Legends or any kind of game you would play online. So I think it's a different niche that is uh, architectural games, which, you know, there's a few precedent for that, but definitely not like, you know, the whole world of uh, gaming has different precedent, different references, it has a whole discipline that is different from ours. So definitely cross-disciplinary, but a lot uh, has to do with architecture, spaces, urban theme, um, and social, which, you know, happen in games, but are not specific to them. So we are not taking games over. <laughs> Thank you. Can I ask a question? Hey, Maya. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Hi, Yara. So nice to see you. And so, I mean, I've, I've never seen, I've seen so much of your work, but I've never seen a full lecture. It was, it was really nice um, and beautiful work. Um, this is not a fully formed question, so I apologize before it. Um, I, I've been reading right now um, Legacy Russell's Glitch Feminism, where she... Mm -hmm talks about um, sort of the game or, or virtual space is also a way of, of the in-between space to inhabit for, for marginalized groups, but also for, for people who don't just right, fit in. Maybe, just, maybe, maybe it's not even in terms of our sexuality, of our skin color, of our gender, whatever but maybe it's just because of how architecture is constructed. So towards Lenny's question, maybe as well. I mean, to me, I see your work also as a, as a way of creating space in the architectural discourse, not so much as taking space away in gaming. Um, so how, how do we understand the, the environment that, um, that we inhabit as well, not only gamers write that, the, the, that uh, environment, we as architects also inhabit them. And how can we create space for ourselves through that? I, I know we talked mm. a little bit about that already in like other reviews, um, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in how your projects, um, to me at least, Or in 
in architecture for ourselves. I wonder if you if you want to talk or feel comfortable talking a little bit about that. Yeah. I feel like I'm in a spot where my internet is not great, but Slightly. Yeah, I'm done. <laughs> yeah, but I, I, half I, question. I understand I, the question. You know, as I see it, like there, you know, two enormous book written about digital turn in architecture and how there was that question when we started as architect working with 3D software and you know using Maya that belonged to a different realm that wasn't architecture. And we started modeling in 3D and there were arguments that, oh, but you know, maybe we need to do architecture through plans. And now we see, and you know, with students, we design spaces in 3D before we design them in 2D. So that old shift, if you want, is what I'm arguing now is also happening. So um, the spaces we propose and we design our architecture, they are digital architecture for digital worlds. This is why I talk about Web 3D, Spatial Web, um, Web 3.0 stack, Spatial Web, and Metaverse, because we're designing architecture. It's digital architecture because the world is leading, in my point of view, towards digital realms. Um, so it is actually a quite traditional definition of what architecture and urban spaces are. Uh, they just exist in a different medium and a different interface, which are VR, AR, and they run through different computer computing methods, which are AI and so on. And they're, uh, so they are architecture, they define digital world, they still belong to the discourse of architecture. They're called games because they have interactivity and immersion, which are something that architecture does not have before that. Um, it has storytelling because of interactivity and how you react with those environments, which architecture has, right, is already dragging from um, deconstructivism and so on. So I think it belongs 100% into architecture, the same way that we were arguing if cinema belongs to architecture before that, 3D modeling belongs, and so on. So VR, AR, and mixed reality uh, definitely are for me, the extension of digital realms, architectural digital realms. Just, I mean, you know, you know, I know that we know that just for the students to understand, I did in, in no way question Yara's work being architectural. I wanted, I wanted to hear more about um, her architectural take on that. This, I mean, again, Yara, this is not for you. This is for, for all the students. <laughs> Uh, because I, yeah, I completely, I completely agree. Um, what I think is, is super interesting, what you just said is the, um, yes, it is somewhat like an, a traditional approach, but it's also a multiplicity of approaches, which mm -hmm. I think is, makes, makes it, to me at least, less traditional because it's, it's never singular. It's always about the multiple, multiple point of views, uh, which, yeah. Yeah, I, I have to think about the uh, in for the next lecture, the next question a little bit more, but super interesting. Thank you. Yeah, no, I 100% I agree with that diverse city of point of view. And this is what's really cool about these spaces is because we have the architecture and this is why we talk about feedback loops. You're able to go into these spaces, experience them, give feedback to your designers, but you're also able to experience them as a community, right? So because we work with VR networking, which means you can be in real time, multiple people in the same VR space and you can communicate like, um, yeah, like hanging out in virtual space. You, we take feedback from how this experience goes, the spaces around you. Um, on more current project, we work on developing a full system of how um, a city would be. And we simulate that in VR before we go to actually building it. So it also serves as a research tool in that, a design research tool in that sense. Um, yeah, I, there is a question in the chat. So what do you think is the power of virtual worlds and how well it is accomplished by contemporary technology? Yeah, I think we answered a bit of that question. Um, but on the second part, I think virtual worlds um, power, I don't know if I would call it a power, it's just a spatial web into which we're walking right now. So things are going to become more and more uh, virtual. If you see statistic of how much time people stand, uh, sp spend in game engine and VR spaces, um, it seems like it's uh, quite big and should be taken into consideration. 
uh, plus we are super interested in it. Um, and then the second part of your question, how well is it accomplished by contemporary technology? I would say, the, you know, AR has uh, come a really long way. VR is still in the process of being developed um, because of computing power and because of the headset and because of so many hardware issue. It's still maybe not a medium as, uh, as much used as you would want to. But it's still, you know, it's like computer, it just gets better and the VR headsets are getting better, cheaper, uh, more accessible and have better graphics, lag less. Um, if you look at the history of VR in the start, it was really hard to be in those spaces because you would get dizzy and so on. And the headset was super heavy. There was a headset called the Sword of Democrat, Democles and it would like hang from the ceiling as much as it was because it was super heavy and right now you can wear them. You don't really need a computer. It has camera sensor. So, you know, it gets better like every technology. So I'm curious to see the future of that uh, and of uh, virtual world and spaces. So like cryptocurrency and um, the metaverse are taking over. You can do so much. You can live an alternative life in those spaces. And this is the world, like the spatial web is a world we're interested in being architects for. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Yara. This was fantastic. I mean, I want to I wanna try and be respectful for everybody's time, but if possible, I would like to slot in a couple of questions <laughs> also myself. Um, first of all, I, I wanted to, uh, I, wanted, I would like for you, uh, if possible, to comment on, uh, on this sort of absence of um, of any reading of objects in isolation. Like, I'm not, I mean, in my mind, I think it has something to do with the fact that the project that you described, the larger project, the research project is uh, so um, invested in the idea of working through the design of environments, uh, of interactive, along different sort of ramps or, or, or scales of uh, interaction, uh, but it's always about environments. But, uh, but I wonder, I think that this is really a, a very contemporary conversation to be had in terms of like, what do we focus on uh, in our design thinking? Uh, uh, of course, it's not a novel conversation as like uh, sort of, semi-historical semi roots right now as well. But my, my, I, I would like to, for you to sort of maybe uh, say a little bit about that, like if it's something that like you actively pursue uh, or if it's something that just happens out of like, uh, um, like I said, like a, a relationship to the, to the technology or to the sort of uh, outcome that you are after. Um, which yeah. because in, in itself is like a totally uh, very very counter to uh, to what we see many times architects focusing on uh, on the individual object. And so I'm I'm curious to know if you could speak a little bit about that. Yeah, you mean like the fact that as architects we today maybe in contemporary discourse understand architecture as designing objects mm. that are individual and. Um, not related to any context or any reality and so on. And then, but you know, as you know, like in the history of architecture, there have been an argument for the field conditions and understanding architecture in connection with its context, um, in connection with social, economical uh, factors of where, you know, regionalism and all of that. And there's the other side, which is looking at architecture as an object, as an aesthetical representational uh, result which is meant to look beautiful. Um, and I think that, you know, VR inherently, you are inhabiting those spaces. So you are already starting from like a bottom up or inside out logic. So you're in already inhabiting a space, right? So you could have objects that you move around with your hands and look at them from outside. But since VR plays with scale, it's so, it's inherent to that medium that you would be visiting and walking through these spaces. So I think an object doesn't account for human experience where VR is all about human experience and bottom up. 
Um, so I think that I would argue that with VR, there's a shift where you're not designing through the bird eye view or you're not designing architecture as an object, but you're designing architecture as inhabitable, inhabitable material. Um, mm. So if you want, I think it follows more the other half of the discourse, which is linked to field or understanding architecture within a context, a region, which I think for me, I'm more interested in. This is why I say we work with social theme. Uh, we work with geopolitical themes because we are interested in those details that get taken out when you look at it as an object, mm. meaning we're interested in the politics of the space, of gender, of economy, of what, you know, why the project looks so different when it's in the Middle East and dealing with trash. When you look at uh, belonging, which is set in Los Angeles and looks at residential neighborhood, you know, it has a completely different feel and look to it. And because it deals with two completely different social political spaces. Um, if you were to design an object, you know, you wouldn't need to link it to its context so much like through architecture discourse, right? It exists on its own. It's not related to anything. It's about its, its aesthetics. Um, I care deeply about aesthetics, but I also care about the politics of these spaces and who are inhabiting them. So maybe it comes back to what Maya was saying before with the diversity of voices or the diversity of who inhabits those spaces. Um, so maybe we are as a medium because you inhabit the space in 3D, virtual um, environment is inherently about human experience, whereas the object is about this looking from the outside, never cutting or looking in. Um, there is that, but I think there is also the political and like someone else could have completely different object oriented work with VR, but that's not what mm. we do because we want to deal with the messiness, you know, the dirtiness of things, meaning talking about gender, politics, diversity, and all of these topics that are um, harder to unify in one object. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um... And in a sense, I think, uh, maybe if I can say one last thing before we wrap up, uh, you know, I, I, I love the way that like in your presentation, uh, you know, this messiness, that, again, mm -hmm. with all the goodness that comes out of messiness, uh, seems to be played out in the presentation so that like you have uh, an intro to the project where the ambition and the, elements and the kind of uh, the, the kind of how can I say the elements of your data sets uh, mm. not only from a technical perspective but also from your research perspective are sort of laid out in a kind of a very analytical way uh, and then through also the music and the kind of uh, the, the switch on of, of, of the ambience in a sense you know like you jump inside and we're now looking not at the setup but we're looking at the reception of the piece. Mm. Uh, and, and it kind of begins to have a certain, uh, um, I want to say like a life of its own, where uh, a certain distancing between you as the author that puts together all the building blocks of your thinking and the kind of op operative aspect of how this uh, device is then used by the audience, by the users, by uh, the AI that is de generating the, 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 the interactions or the environment itself. Uh, I think it produces really a beautiful shift between these two moments. And uh, what I really like about the presentation mm -hmm. is that you don't, the ambition is not to resolve this dissonance or this kind of uh, difference between these two aspects of the work, but they can just be and co coexist in a sense, like the fact that there are all of these building blocks, they're neat and organized, and there is the reception, which is other, and it's there and it works very well. So. I don't know, um, is that somewhat, what do you think about that? Like, does that make yeah. any sense to, <laughs> to the work? Or? Yeah, no, I think it's a great read. Like you're right, we always talk about how we collaborate with our tools. We don't use them, we collaborate and we see how they respond to what we do. And so I think there is that collaborative aspect that, you know, shouldn't lead to a result. It should lead to a discussion, a conversation. Mm. And this is what, that you call this dissonance, right? Like you look at these environments and they are spaces of, and when we do this network VR, you know, there are spaces of discussion, there are spaces to explore. 
they are not spaces to resolve. Um, mm. Yeah, so I I think 100% agree with that. And maybe this is why um, this second part of the question of the thesis question where um, we talk about a feedback loop is where there will always be a loop of back and forth. It's not a final result, even though you're experiencing the work when I present it today as a, you know, as where it stands and made to be received by all of you. Um, but all of these are, you know, live existing spaces that are running in real time and you can go to them in any time and, you know, whatever mm -hmm. happened in the space before when you visit it later, it looks slightly different. So these that I show are recordings, so they're only specific to that time where I recorded them. But these spaces, yeah, they have their life of their own and they get developed depending on who visits them. And so I would say, yeah, they're definitely not answers or results. They're places for discourse and research production. Mm. That's great. That's beautiful. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Yara. Uh, thank you so much. It's a joy to be in conversation with all of you. And I was so happy to show all of you my work and share it and prepare for it. Thank you. I mean, like I said, we, we could go on forever, but I want to try and be as uh, respectful I, as I can of this uh, never ending Zoom land. Um, so yeah. thank you. Thank you again for for joining us uh, for the beautiful presentation and hopefully we'll be able to share more of our work with you later uh, from the students and from the from the research here in Florence. Yeah, thank you so much. Looking forward. And if any of you want to reach out or have any question, feel free to email me and I send my two links in the chat. Um, yeah, don't be shy. Thank you so much. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay, take care, Yara. And uh, it was lovely to see the entire group again on, on Zoom. And I will see everybody in, uh, in studio now, <laughs> in the three studios as we go. Bye, Yara. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Daniele, sorry, excuse me.